thank him for the day that he washed my sins away and, and, uh, and the old account was settled. Before... Before we look into God's Word, uh, I believe that Brother Leonard texted Elaine and had a, a special request. And so we're going to take a moment and, and pray for this. I will have her tell you the request in just a moment. And then also, uh, Brother Leonard called me today. He's getting stronger. Uh, and uh, this coming Sunday, if things progress like they are, will be the last Sunday that I will be filling in for him. And he said that he feels things continue to go, that by the f Sunday after that, I believe which is the fourth, that he'll be ready to go. And so we're looking forward to that, and so we want to keep him in his prayers. But I'm going to have her read this prayer request, and then we're going to pray uh, for the prayer request, and we're also going to pray for our brother Leonard. Sister Williams and her sister Connie that has cancer, Sister Williams and her two brothers and Alice have driven to Tennessee to see Connie, and that they need prayer. Also, Tom Lambert has cancer, and Tom Lambert's daughter-in-law, gallbladder ruptured, and they need prayer. Serious stuff, yes. but I know the one that can handle it. Yes. Amen. Will you stand with me, and let's ask the Lord right now if he'll undertake in these situations. Our Heavenly Father, you heard the request as they have been read, and we bring them to you, and we bring them to you in confidence and with faith, knowing that you have the ability and that you are willing, hallelujah, to touch and to meet these needs. And so I pray that you will cause that cancer to die, the one with the gallbladder. Master, heal that individual. I pray those that is traveling that you will cover them with your blood. And I want to thank you as you have touched our pastor, Leonard, and may he continue to gain his strength, and I pray as he gains his physical strength that you will even put a fresh and stronger anointing up on him and give him the power, hallelujah, and the authority to lead this church as you've called him to do. We pray that you will answer each one of these according to your will, and then bless this service and have your way in it. And we thank you in thy lovely name. Amen. God bless you. My wife is not able to be with us tonight, and I miss her. She was sitting in the living room, and I think it was tea that she was drinking, and the door was open. And a bee came in, and she did not see it, and it stung her in the mouth. But that wasn't going to slow her down. She was going to make it. And then later, a little while before service, she started getting a headache. And so she just wasn't able to, to make it. So I miss her. And uh, so let's keep her in our prayers. You know, it's amazing to me how that God uses different people, and people that you would have, you know, you, you just wouldn't have thought of. Uh, I've seen this all my life, that uh, uh, people in the church, and there's those that have an outgoing personality, and they have talent, and God uses them, but then there'll be someone that uh, is kind of timid, maybe they never even finished school, and all of a sudden, God will bless them and anoint them, and whatever their ministry is, it just grows to be a tremendous success. And and I uh, remember uh, standing in front of a 
committee to get my credentials and I did not have the money to go to Bible school and yet I uh, was furnished books and had to study as ministers know for a few years before I uh, was ordained but I was asked a lot of questions and I think I startled them because I was in the Assembly of God and and uh, someone uh, there uh, was it was just getting to where if you didn't go to school you might not get credentials and so I kind of got by that and then, and then the question come up well how do you know that uh, God has called you to the assemblies of God and I'm just a young person and and as honest as I can and I said well God has called me to preach I know that but I says I do not know that he ever called me to be in the assemblies of God and they said well why 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 are you here and I says well because I kind of grew up in that I know a lot of preachers and I said I'm acquainted with them and I feel that God's called me to be an evangelist and I just think that it'll be easier to get started because I know some of these boy there was some some kind of frowns there a little bit but uh, uh, I remember uh, brother Gresset as he said you know education is good but he says I would to God that in like days past that he would call somebody out of the field cotton fields to take off their overalls be anointed of God and go get the job done and I seen uh, that happen a lot and I was thinking today that Jesus was born in a stable and he made the statement that he had nowhere to lay his head and I think of Elaine when Pentecost was poured out at the turn of the century uh, and uh, the Holy Spirit moved and it spread across the globe and most of the time it was on the other side of the tracks it was I mean uh, w when Uzu Street happened it wasn't in some big cathedral some uh, fancy temple or but it was kind of in a rundown place a and it just seems like the Lord will use people who other people have rejected. Have you noticed that? I, I, I see that a lot. And what I want to talk about this evening for a little while is I have met a lot of people who gave their heart to the Lord. Their sins has been washed away. But in their journey with God, for some reason they became discouraged in whatever plan and how many of you believe that God has a plan for every individual amen I there's not an individual that God doesn't have a plan for saved unsaved give your heart to the Lord he has a plan for you he he said he wants you to be the head not the tail he has he has a plan for you and God does not ever give you a plan and you're going to fail in if you walk with him you'll not fail in it there may be struggles but you'll not fail God never fails and can't fail his plans for you cannot become a disaster it will always be victoriously and so I I see people and it seems like in this time of pressure I'm just continually meeting people who will say yeah you know I uh, one time I uh, sang in a choir or one time I taught Sunday school or one time I had this type of ministry and now it seems like confusion has came in and they are no longer active in that ministry but it seems like they're going here and there and here and there searching for the ministry I, I can't tell you how many people that I've dealt with and they will just flat come out and say yeah I guess I have been running from God you know man is the only person being animal whatever 
and I'm not calling man an animal, but I'm referring to any living creature, that when they get lost, they run. You can take an animal someplace, uh, and if it gets lost, uh, I mean, I've been hunting with dogs, and a dog get lost, and you lay your coat down, and you leave, and, and, and you come back maybe the next day, and he'll be laying there on the coat, but you get a person and they're out in the woods someplace and they get lost, they begin to run. And uh, they don't calm down and, and sometimes they lose their very life and it was because of the panic that had set in. And I see that spiritually when uh, people that one time walked with God and they are no longer really in his will, they have begun to run, and it's a sad situation. And you can deal with them, and they will give you different excuses. Well, I uh, got hurt in church, or uh, I don't think I have the ability. Well, now they want you to have an education, and I don't have this education. Well, I just don't get fit. But I, 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 I believe it's time that we realize who has called us and who we are laboring for and, and have the confidence that if God called us, that we are going to succeed. And I, I'm going to read some names to you and show you people that God has called, the problems that they've had, and yet when they put faith in God, they were more than overcomers and used victoriously. When I read the Bible and I have a list, there's no way that I can talk about all of them or no way I even uh, have all the names down, but I want you to in your mind go back with some of these people that God had used and other people had rejected. God used Moses, remember, and, and uh, Moses felt that he couldn't do the job because Moses stuttered. Naomi, God used her. She was a widow. God used Jacob. He was a liar. God used Martha. She was a weary wart. Solomon had too many wives. Peter was a hothead. Abraham was too old. Jonah ran from God. David, he was too young. Thomas, he was a doubter. And Jeremiah was timid in speech and he could not relate. If you read Jeremiah 1, 4, 10, but God touched his lips and used him. Timothy was the son of a mixed marriage and how could that work out? Because his grandmother and his mother was Jews, but uh, his mother was married to a Greek. And as odd as that would seem, uh, the Jews who lived by the law and believed in circumcision, well, his mother and grandmother were Christians, and so he was not circumcised or raised according to the Jewish law, and the dad was a, was a Greek, and... and uh, seemed like he didn't care what happened and this boy grew up uh, mother and grandmother Jews but uh, not believing in that and a father that it was a Greek and everything was mixed up and yet Timothy was mightily used of God. But I want to talk about uh, a, a couple of these for just a little while to show you how God can take and use you in spite of what you think is shortcomings because if God has called you 
and has a plan for your life, then you're going to come through victoriously uh, no matter what the circumstances are. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Judges, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about a couple of these others. And Judges, the 11th chapter. And I'm going to start reading at the first verse. And it says, And Jephthah the Galenite was, listen to this, boy, you talk about a change. He was a mighty man of valor. Wow. In the very next sentence, says he was the son of a harlot or a prostitute. I mean, this was a, a mighty man of valor, but he was the son of a harlot. Gilead beget Jephthah, and Gilead's wife bare him sons. And his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah, and said unto him, Thou shall not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. Then Jephthah fled his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered main men to Jephthah and went out with him. And it came to pass in the process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Galilee went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob. And I want you to uh, notice this, the elders. So it was uh, Jephthah, his brothers run him off and says, hey, you, you're you not one of us. And, and he had to flee. But then the, the, the leaders of the community got involved in this. And they said unto Jephthah, the sixth verse, come and be our captain that we may fight with the children of Ammon. And Jephthah said unto the elders, now he's not talking, so it lets you know that it wasn't just his brothers that had turned on him, the whole community did. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, did you, did you, did not you hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are you come unto me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore we turn again to thee, now that thou mayest go with us and fight against the children of Ammon, and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? And the elders Gilead said unto Jephthah, The Lord be witness between us if we do not so accordingly to thy words. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord. Notice this. This man still had confidence. He wasn't talking to just the people, but he realized that his words was going before the Lord. And Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, Why hast thou to do with me, that thou art come against me to fight in my land? And the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt, from Arnon even to Jabuk, and unto Jordan. Now therefore restore those lands again peaceably. And Jephthah sent messengers again to the king of the children of Ammon, and he said unto them, Thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up out of Egypt, they walked through the wilderness into the Red, unto the Red Sea, and came to Kadesh. And Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom, saying, Let me, I pray thee, pass through the land. But the king of Edom would not hearken. Therefore... And in like manner they sent unto the king of Moab, and he would not consent. And Israel abode in Kadesh. Then they went along through the wilderness and compassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab, and came by the east side of the land of Moab, and, and pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. 
And Israel sent messengers unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon. And Israel said unto him, Let us pass, we pray, through thy land into my place. But Sihon said, Trusted not in Israel to pass through his coast. But Sihon gathered all his people together and pitched in Jaaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon to all the people in the land of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites and the inhabitants of the country. And they possessed all the coast of the Amorites from Arnon even unto Jabuk, and from the wilderness even unto Jordan. So now the Lord God of Israel hath disposed the Amorites from before his people Israel, and shouldest thou possess it. I, I'm closing with this next verse, but it's important. I, I, I want you to get this. This, this kind of gets me a little happy. Because he's talking to those people, and he's talking about the God that they served, and he's asking the question, if you're God, and, uh, and that's with the small g, if your idols, if your God give you something, uh, wouldn't you possess it? He asked, he asked this question. He says, will not thou possess that which Simosh, which is a, a God, thy God, an idol, give it to thee to possess? Wouldn't you possess it? And then he says this, boy, I like this. So whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, them will we possess. Amen. If our God is going to drive out the enemies before us, then we're going to possess it. If he, if he drives out uh, enemies in our land, we're going to possess the land. And it's true today. If our God is going to drive out fear, then you need to possess it. If he's going to uh, drive out your enemies, if he's going to drive out habits, if he's going to drive out sickness, then we need to go and possess it because that is what God is doing for us. And yet sometimes we kind of uh, just said, but I, I, you've got a picture in your, your mind, the story that I just read to you. Here is a man and young man and his father has an affair with a prostitute and he uh, no fault of his own and then uh, his father uh, has other children by his wife and they begin to grow up and then somehow the uh, brothers find out that this one isn't by their mother but he's by the son of a prostitute and they turn against him and, and they in the city says hey you're not going to inherit anything that our father has you don't have an inheritance you're really not one of us just pack up and get out and and so this young man I can see him as he gets up and he gets his things and he begins to leave and it's not his fault and I imagine that as he goes out into the wilderness, I can just picture him sitting down on a log someplace. And he's got to be one heart broken and one lonely individual. I'm out here in the wilderness and no one seems to care about me. It seems like everyone is against me and it's not my fault. My brothers, I played with them and we grew up and we, we laughed and just like, but then they found out something about me that I had nothing to do with and they told me to get out and now I sit here with no place to go and I'm in a wilderness by myself. And you know that is what the enemy wants to do to you. He wants to make you lonely and he wants to drive you out to where you have no companionship, where you have no Christian fellowship, where you have no one praying for you, where you have no one encouraging you. The enemy wants you to be sitting someplace on a log, broken hearted, defeated, downtrodden, thinking even God doesn't care. That's what the enemy wants. And there you can find yourself in a wilderness, in a lonely place. And there can be people around you constantly bumping elbows with you. There can be a mob around you, but you can still be lonely because you feel all alone. 
There's those who have struggles that they don't want to talk about and, and they bump elbows with people, but they're all alone. There's been so many times that I have knelt at an altar with a person and they said, I'm so lonely, I'm all alone, I don't think that I have a friend. And that's where the enemy wants them. I will never forget a young preacher who married and, and uh, he, the was pastor in a church and the, the love just didn't seem to be there even though he loved her very much. And I remember one time after a service somebody went up and said, boy, that was a good sermon. That was powerful. I enjoyed it. And he started crying. And somebody says, what's wrong? What, 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 did, what, what did I say? I, what? And he says, I wish... I could hear my wife say that just one time. The devil wants you alone. And there is an individual whose family has drove him out. The community has drove him out. He has no friend. He's out in the wilderness brokenhearted and in despair. No doubt he has to hunt in order to live off the land and evidently he gets to be an expert with weaponry and his cunningness out in the field. And after a while he is attracting people, the Bible said vain men, people of like manner, people who were outcast and it makes me think of David after a while there's a group of these kind of people what future has this son of a prostitute got and yet we know from reading the word he trusted it and believed in God even from his early, early years and suddenly, Israel was going to be attacked. And they said, we need a leader. We need somebody that has courage, somebody that has strength, somebody that has a calling, somebody that needs God. Oh, I've got it. Let's go call for Jephthah. And so word is sent out to him. And said, Ammon, is, they're coming to fight us and we need a leader. Will you come and help us? And he says, wait, wait a minute. Why are you calling on me? It hasn't been that long ago that my family turned against me. My brothers disowned me. The leaders of the community drove me out. And now you're asking that I come and fight for you. And he said, if I do and my God gives me victory and we're able to defeat the enemy, then will you make me the leader? And they swore unto him that they would do that. And so the war begins to break out. And God's hand is up on this person in a mighty way. What? God's not guiding the priest. God's not using this prophet. God hasn't picked at this time a mighty warrior or an educated man, but God has picked an outcast the son of a prostitute to deliver Israel. Yes, that's exactly what has happened. And so Jephthah brings a great victory to Israel. And the enemy is, is saying, well, we just want this piece of land and will you give it to us? And I like what he said. He says, if God has delivered this into our hands, we're going to possess it. If God gives it to me, we're going to take it. If God's going to give us victory, we're going to claim it. Hallelujah!
Hallelujah. If God's going to give me a shout, I'm going to shout. If God gives me joy, I'm going to dance. If God gives me healing, I'm going to testify. If God's going to give me victory over my enemies, I'm going to claim it. Hallelujah. If God's going to give me victory over my trials, over my sicknesses, then I'm going to claim it. Whatever God gives me, I'm going to take it because that is his desire to lift up these people who others has cast down and say you're my leader and great victory is going to come because it's amazing who God chooses to use. And I want to talk to some of you that is listening to my voice and somewhere in the past you know it that God has placed the calling upon your life and he has used you and you can remember around the altar or someplace hugging necks and people smiling and you was a blessing to them and you was helping them but somewhere you got your feelings hurt or there was an argument or, or, or somebody said something and you let the enemy come in and trick you and now you find yourself out in the wilderness sitting on a log you still love God but you're not where you used to be I want to encourage you to cry out to God Almighty for the plan that he had for you he still has for you and he wants to use you he wants to anoint you he wants to restore you and bring the smile and joy back in your life I pray that you will seek him amen And then I want to refer really quickly to one more. This great man, Elijah. I'll not be long with this, but th th this, th this, this story does something to me. He had just called fire down from heaven. He had slain the prophets of Baal. I mean, he had so much faith he called fire down from heaven and the sacrifice was consumed. And he'd killed all these prophets of Baal, but Jezebel says, I'm going to find him and I'm going to kill him, and he's on the run. I don't figure how, how he could face the king and all these men, and, and this one woman puts him on the run, but he's running. And he takes off, and he, he's under a juniper tree, and the Lord comes and talks to him, and and, and an angel feeds him and then he travels and he finds a cave and in the 19th chapter of Kings he's on the run and it says and he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb the mount of God and he came thither unto a cave he came to a cave and he lodged there. And behold, a word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou, Elijah? What, what are you doing in this cave? I mean, you are a fighter. You're a warrior. You, you, you call fire down from heaven, and now you're hiding. In a, Elijah, what in the world are you doing in there? And Elijah says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts and for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord and behold the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break it in pieces of rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Hear me carefully. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entering of the cave.
Have you found yourself in that situation? You're hurt and you feel lonely and I don't know why I, I, I'm feeling this in my spirit, but there's been a lot of people that has been hurt because of a disagreement. And if there's someone that is hearing this and you're one of those, and you said, I really didn't want to cause any trouble, so I just left and I... Yeah, I, I'm in a cave. I'm kind of in a dark, cold place. And I'm lonely. I, I just... didn't want to cause any... I, I just quit, I guess. I'm just kind of hiding out. And it is you, my friend, that is losing. And you say, I'm tired. It seems like my, the whole earth is shaking. It seems like my mountains is falling apart. It seems like everything is on fire and it's burning around me. It seems like my world is shaking. So I'm just hiding in a cave. And Elijah heard. I'm feeling the anointing of the Holy Spirit right now. And Elijah heard that small voice. And he came out of the cave. Out of the darkness into the light. And I know because of the Holy Spirit that I'm feeling right now that the Lord is talking to someone. And you can hear in your heart, it's not just your conscience, it's the Holy Spirit dealing with you one more time, saying gently, not in a thunderous way, but gently and quietly, Son, I want to use you. Come out of that dark, cold, lonely cave into the marvelous light. For it is not I that has rejected you. I have a plan for you. Come. Come, come back. Come back to where you were at. And you feel it. And you're aware of it. And I know that you do because my spirit is bearing witness that gentle voice is saying, come home again, son. Put it behind you. I've got an important mission for you. I love you. I died for you. Come out of that dark place. Come home. I'm going to pray right now. I'm not closing, but I want to pray. Our Heavenly Father, right now there's someone that you're dealing with. I sense it right now. Master, you're speaking to someone and you're calling them out of that cold, lonely, dark cave into the glorious sunlight because you have a plan for them. Master, they got sidetracked, but they hear that small voice and you said that no one comes to you except the Spirit draw them, and right now the Holy Spirit is speaking to their heart. And I pray, Master, as you so gently speak to them, that they will ask forgiveness and come into the marvelous light. And you said your gifts and your calling was out without repentance. That once you gave them, they were always there. And they're coming back now. And you're going to use them greater than they ever have in all their life. That smile, that blessing to others is going to be there. Jesus, right now, 
Forgive them and restore them and use them in the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. Thank you. When he forgives us for our sins, and that's who he uses, folks. Most of the time he uses people that others has rejected. And he wants to use you. You know, I'm closing with this. The Bible says that when we have our faults or our sins, he, he, he casts them over, well, it says that they, he casts them behind him. In other words, he throws our sins over his shoulder and he doesn't look back to see where they landed. In another place, and I have the scriptures here, uh, it, 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 it says that he cast them into the depth of the sea. And there was a testimony, I believe, in about 69 or 70, one you never forget, an old man stood up to testify. And he said this, he said, 77 years ago, God cast my sins into the sea. And he says, some places the sea is over six miles deep. And I've never, ever wanted to put on a diving suit and go look for them. When the Lord forgives you of your faults, he doesn't remember them against you anymore. And if David had to come back and Jeremiah had a problem and Elijah, Jephthah became a ruler, the son of a prostitute. Don't you let the devil, no devil in hell, tell you that you're not good enough, that you're not precious, that you're not, ha, don't have royal blood. Don't you sit in that cave. You come out. You find your church. You come here. We'll help you get started and be a blessing. Jesus, I feel that something has been accomplished in this service. Somewhere, someplace, somebody has heard this message and they're coming home. It's not me that they've heard. It's that small voice saying, you've been in that cave long enough, son, daughter. Come out into the morning. And they're coming. And I pray that this night will be the most important night in their lives that great victories will be brought to their ministry as they've picked up hallelujah, hallelujah, the gift that you give them, and they're going to use it in what time we have left. Bless us and help us all to be labors for you until you come, and we'll thank you for it in thy lovely name. Amen. God bless each one of you. Hallelujah. Can we do one thing? Can we just lift our hands and thank him for our sins forgiven? Let's just do that for a moment. Our Heavenly Father, we have to. We, we can't leave without lifting our hands and thanking you for the day that you have cast our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. Master, that you've taken away the burden and you've given us a calling, you've given us a place to minister. Oh, hallelujah, our names is written down in the Lamb's book of life. We thank you for it, Master. We thank you for being our friend. We thank you for being our Savior, for being our healer, for being our Redeemer. Hallelujah, we thank you for that. And we give you thanks. Hallelujah, from the very top of our voice, we thank you. Jesus, help us to always be appreciative of what you've done for us. Glory to God. We love you. In your precious name, we thank you. Glory.